So we were the first generation of players who played six years of amateur rugby Tuesday, Thursday night to suddenly professional. And I remember my coach saying to me the next day, he said, um, how many days do you reckon we should bring everyone in? You need to create an environment that's so good, everyone wants to be part of it and no one wants to leave. And what he did in English rugby is create that. He created a situation where I'd finish a game at, at my club, I couldn't wait to get in the car and drive down to wherever we were and walk in that, that room. He's got the best win record. Yeah, he's got the highest percentage I mean, of, of, of winning. You, I, in... I have to say, picking up from a few things that you've said, I'm not entirely sure that you're one of his biggest admirers. Have I read no, that no, wrong? no, no. I like him. I like him a lot. This is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So with this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up to proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way. And more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, a man who in his chosen sport reached the very pinnacle, in part inspired by tragedy. A captain on both the domestic and international fronts, a one-club man. He played three Lions tours, securing four Six Nations titles for England, and played an integral part in the historic 2003 Rugby World Cup triumph. Lawrence Delalio, welcome to Upfront. Yeah, welcome. Lovely to be here. Nice to Thank see you. you. I was saying to you before we went on air, have I lost my mind, but I'm pretty sure that you and I sat on a flight flying back from Portugal at some ridiculous football league uh, conference that I was bitching and whining about having to attend. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you were there as, as a guest of some shape or form. I was. I was there as a guest of uh, a friend of mine, Steve Hayes, who, who owned Wickham Wanderers at the time. I know Steve, yeah. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I went to my seat 1A, but you were sat in it, so I thought, well, I won't, I won't argue with him. I'll just let him sit there. I'm pretty sure if you'd have asked me, mate, I'd, I'd have moved. <laughs> um, one of the things that we do... Lawrence in this podcast with guys like you is for want of a better expression find the why find yeah. the trigger that built you into being the person that you were when I'm talking to boxers and there's been a few on this show they come with tales of adversity I don't mean yeah. tales and I don't take that lightly but I mean stories of their backgrounds and how disadvantaged they were because they're going into the hurt business and whilst I don't compare rugby to boxing you are going into a sport that in part you know you're going to get hurt in at some yeah. point what were the driving forces? What made Lawrence Delalio from where he started to where you are now? What were the triggers for you, yeah, so A, to get into rugby, yeah. and, and B, to be the person that you are? Well, I think it's, it's always an interesting question, and it's one I've tried to answer um, as explicitly and honestly as possible. Um, because what you see out in the rugby field is is, is a human being that yeah. has to obviously get themselves into a, into a position to go into battle. Um, but all your all your vulnerability, strengths, everything is exposed out in the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, going back to my childhood, uh, um, my parents owned a confectionery, sweet shop, news agents, whatever yep. you call it. So in Stepney, um, okay. in the East End of London. East End of London. My mum um, worked incredibly hard. Uh, my dad then started to get a job in a hotel, and my mum had an epiphany where she moved from Bethnal Green to Barnes in South West London. Okay. Um, which was a result. Change of pace, isn't it? Um, and I guess the two things I had throughout my childhood and throughout my life was unconditional love mm -hmm. from my parents, especially from my mum. Right. And when I say unconditional, I mean, when the police used to knock on the door, you, not my Lawrence, you must have the wrong address. That's okay. Like, <laughs> was that a regular occurrence? Well, then? occasionally. I wouldn't okay. say I, was, I, wasn't in, I wasn't in a lot of trouble, but I, I caused a few heartaches and a few um, headaches for sure. And also a belief system that, you, that anything and everything was possible. So... Who's, who's, who instilled that in from you? Your mum? Mom. Yeah, for East End okay. London, one of ten. Right. You know, grew up in, in relative poverty during the war, but had real toughness, real yeah. resilience, and always a smile on her face. I mean, you know, I always watch that programme, East Enders. It's no representation of the East End at all. Right, it's a miserable, program, miserable show. Yeah. And my mum refused to watch it because no one's like that in yeah. East End. They smile all the time. Um, when, they, when they've got yeah. lots of reasons not to. But I think that set me up very well. Um, my sister was a very talented ballet dancer. Um, yeah. She got into the Royal Ballet at the age of five and she got a scholarship into the Royal Ballet. So okay. I think what that allowed is my parents to think a bit differently. My mum always wanted to get the best for me and for her. And so I got taken Where out. Where was your dad in this? Uh, he, was, he was working in the hotel yeah. industry, but I was taken out of state school and put into private school. Now, whether that was a, that was a conscious decision from my mum, she right. wanted to give me the best, um, you know, and, and strive for that. And I think it, it took me on a slightly different journey because... Uh, State system is what it is now, mm -hmm. um, but it, it exposed me to a whole world of different things. My mum used to say, you are what you're exposed to in life, good and bad, sure. and I want to try and expose you to as many good things as possible. Product of your environment, ultimately. Yeah, and 
I think the difference is my sister was born to dance. I don't think I wasn't born to play rugby. Right. I mean, people look at me and, and I'm obviously a bit smaller than I used to be. But um, if you're going to choose a career, I wouldn't have chosen rugby. I mean, it's it's not very nice. It's quite right. it's quite unglamorous, quite sort of, you know, it's pretty rough, tough. Did you like any other sports? Yeah, I was really interested in sport. I was fanatical. I mean, the way it works is you, you think you're good at football. And I was half decent, to be fair. And then you play against someone who's really good and you realise, you actually, I'm not yeah. that good. Yeah. Um, and if you can catch, you play rugby. And if you can't, I guess they stick you in a boat and you row. But... Right. Okay. <laughs> how, do you, how do you end up in a position? Because without being disrespectful, mm. it doesn't sound to me if your upbringing was particularly affluent. No. So how do you get into a situation where your parents are putting you into the private school system? Yeah. Well, I think they, they work. Is it just sacrifice? They just sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've got children of my own now, three. And um, you always try and take all the things you learned in your own childhood and, and hopefully get rid of the ones that weren't so pleasant yeah. and, and try and replace them. And, and then and, give them the best And, what you and can. make them humble yeah. and all that sort of thing. And, and we had a, a very loving, caring family. But you're right. Um, you know, it was, if you look at rugby, I think it, <clears throat> it's slightly losing its it's um tag but it's very white middle class elite sport and all the boys go to posh private schools mm -hmm. and the irony is that i came from a background that was nothing to do with that right. but i ended up going to quite a posh private school in fact i went to a place called ampleforth college in yorkshire run by benedictine monks um, so let me get this right you've gone from the east end of london yeah to barnes yeah and now you're up in North North Yorkshire. Yorkshire, yeah. I think my, I was getting into in and out of trouble at home, and my mum just said, "I need to get you out of London." And actually, it was the pre, it's the premier Catholic school in the country. Right, was at the time, um, and I was looking at the bills going. I water would be expensive. I mean, I don't know how. Mm. I, I, I still to this day not quite sure how they managed to make ends meet in that regard. But I guess it, they probably sacrificed some of their own uh, benefits and and life experiences yeah. in order to provide. Coming from the background I came from, I didn't quite initially. I wasn't the same as all the other kids that were there. Mm -hmm. I spoke very differently. I was, you know, just born and bred in London, and yeah, it's very so different. It's different. So um, it took me a while to settle in, but I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, we go back to the question why. Um, I mean, I played rugby, but I, but I wasn't really, I mean, they had a very high standard there, so I wasn't necessarily in the first team. Yeah. Um, and then I had a moment in my life, I lost my sister very tragically yeah. in the Marchioness, yeah. a boat disaster, sat around the table with her and my mum and my dad. She went off to a boat party, never came back. Yeah, I lost one of my yeah. one of my friends from school. His sister, yeah. Jane, died on the yeah. Marchioness. So whilst it would never have touched me yeah. quite the way it touched you, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, that, that led me down a, a different path because that was at 16. I was yeah. still at Ampleforth. It was in the summer of 1989. Yeah. And, well, 17 actually just. And, uh, you know, as you would expect, it completely blew my life devastation. apart. Yeah, devastation. Absolutely. And, you know, and also the just the... The not the the suddenness of it, you know, mm. they're they're one day gone the gone next, the next yeah. and you know, clearly as a parent now, you can appreciate that the worst punishment you could ever inflict on anyone is watching them bury one of their own children. Absolutely, and it was just it, it blew our world apart. And I think for the next year, I went back to Amforth, but clearly things weren't right. Um, you know, I wasn't expelled, but it, for want of a better word, it was probably in my best interest and theirs that I didn't carry on my education because you know I was in I was in a mess. Yeah. Um, so I left there pretty soon after that, um, wandered around aimlessly, lost, questioning the reason for being, and, and just grieving, really. Grieving in a way that um, was was very painful. And I was watching my mum, you know, there was an incredible campaign, a bit like Hillsborough, you know, there was no public inquiry for the mm. Marchioness. And, um, you know, 51 people lost their lives. But my mum bought one share in Ready Mix Concrete. She went to their AGM two years after the right. uh, Marchioness. And got to AOB and she stood up and she said, yeah, you murdered my daughter mm -hmm. and 51 other people. And she spoke for an hour and a half mm -hmm. and they hung their heads in shame. And Your mother's a very formidable lady, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, she was. I've seen other uh, quotes attributed yeah. to her about making observations to coaches. How much, how much do you think the journey that you went on and the success that you had is born out of whatever you gained. I mean, that yeah. sounds a terrible thing to yeah. say, gained, but whatever you managed to harness yeah. from well, this tragedy. Well, I think a lot, actually. I mean, I may well have gone on. Don't forget, rugby was not um, a career. No. You know, uh, I played rugby, um, but it was Tuesday. So when I when I sort of eventually came out of my, um, my grieving process, I thought to myself, I, I really need to sort my shit out. So I joined a rugby club. And yeah. I don't know what inspired that, maybe being at Ampleforth, whatever, but I needed a family, a community, a sense of belonging. I needed someone to put their arms around me and just just give me a big hug, not even talk to me about my past. And rugby felt like that place. So I literally 
picked up the newspaper, wasps were there, it jumped out the page to me, and I joined that club. Right. And it's exactly that. It was very humble, looked like a working man's club. I'd come from a school, I had 27 rugby pitches, Wasps had two that were in a state of disrepair. Um, and I walked in there, and from that moment onwards, I never looked back. And slowly but surely, I started to rebuild my own confidence. And my mum and dad, you know, who had no reason to smile, used to come and watch me play. And they started to start, you know, so rugby was a sort of therapy. Yeah. And as a result of that, my driver was wanting to bring my family back together on what was left of it and to honour the memory of my sister, who was the most incredible high achiever. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, it, it, was a, it was a really key driver for me. It was an amateur sport, so no one was being paid. Mm -hmm. um, there was no money involved. And it gave me real purpose in life. Right. It gave me a sense of belonging um, and a set an identity. And I think it was, um, which is probably why I stayed at the same club for 20 years, mm -hmm. because my most an innate sense of belonging. Well, my motivation was was never financial. Yeah. Um, and that was to come later. Um, but it was, it was more around purpose. Yeah. And um, and wanting to do something that um, that was driven and by so much more than just. Um, personal motivation. And I think that becomes quite powerful. Of course it does. It's, yeah. um, it, it becomes a key that. driver. And I think people see that in you. Um, and that's why I try to articulate because it's it's quite a complicated sport rugby and it's you know tying itself in knots, making itself even more complicated. But um, in many ways, it's quite simple because it's about emotion, really. You know, mm -hmm. when, you, when you go to war, you know, if you don't do your job, Simon, you know, I don't get back on the helicopter and you've got to explain to my mum and dad why I'm not home. And yeah, fair enough. No, rugby's not dramatic like that no one loses their life but you know if you don't do your job we get i get hurt no, absolutely right. and we lose yeah. and that's not acceptable i was going to ask you but it seems like a moot point about the the benefit of private education in developing your career as a rugby player mm. because and the reason why i was going to ask you that is because i want to link it into what eddie jones said which was about privilege and adversity because i do think that we live in a society where people aren't particularly resilient they aren't particularly, uh, they, don't, they don't have a great deal of fortitude. And yeah. so I, and there aren't many leaders about. No. And so I, the kind of, whilst he was going off on a tangent and railing against certain parts of the establishment, yeah. I didn't think he was too far fundamentally wrong. No, he's not, wrong. but equally, if you're, if you're trying to, if you haven't got leaders, it, who's, whose responsibility is it to create them? I mean, it's your job. And can if you, you, and if you if can you, you create a leader? Yeah, well, I think you can by giving them some responsibility. Um, but does uh, that create leadership? It can do. It but even be. you are, aren't you a leader? You are even you can sophisticate your leadership, you can refine it, and you can educate it. And but can you create a leader? Well, I think if you haven't got them, you need to. So you need to find a way of creating them. And I think you can. I, th I think it is, it is, um, you know, sometimes, you know, if I, I feel with Eddie, he, he's a he's a really good bloke, right? Um, and I know him quite well. And if you if you sat here, we'd have a really interesting, honest conversation. Um, but. When he when he runs his teams, um, he's so controlling, and so um, he he just has this aura and personality where he has to be in charge of everything, and that's fine. But you know, as, right. as far as I work out, mate, you're not the bloke getting your face smashed in at three o'clock. So um, you know, that's we'll do that, but we're definitely not doing that. And I, I think what he needed in this England setup was someone who challenged him a bit more. Um, okay, I, I think to build a successful team. Um, from my own experience, and not just on a sports field, but in life generally, you need trust and consistency. You need to trust a group of people, um, and you need to be consistent with the message that you tell them mm -hmm. over and over again, and you get better, and you get better, and you get better. And you have to face facts that you are, it's not gonna happen in a straight line. There will be a few little bumps in the road. There'll be passengers that you'll lose along the way. I accept that. You're not good enough, you know. You've gotta be quite ruthless, but trust and consistency. Now, for Eddie Jones, when he took over England, He's, he's had a successful CV, but there was a very um, familiar pattern to it. You know, he'd have instant success and, yeah. then, and then that. Now, if that happens, there's a reason why that happens, because his style of management and coaching burns people, burns out. people out, you know, yeah. and, and you just can't, unless you're turning over your players all the time, which you can't do in rugby because it's not. But isn't it a unique dynamic in, I mean, I, I, what I'm hearing is something that's rather unique to rugby then, because, and correct me if I'm wrong, in this analysis, but Martin Johnson referred to observations that he made about the ignore Clive. Yeah, well, yes and, and no. I mean, there's we'll thing. we'll yeah. sort it out amongst ourselves. But isn't that you, you could say, for example, football? Yeah. And am I right in this? Again, it's, a, it's an assumption on my part. You're correct because you were there. 
that in the dressing room at half time in rugby, it tends to be the players that are more dominant in what's being said rather than the coach. Is that wrong? Or I think right? that's wrong. I think what we have to recognise in, in our sport, what I know, is that, you know, it was an amateur game, right? I'm sat there, you know, I'm, I'm in a rugby club with builders, brokers, entrepreneurs, students, posh public school boys, the whole melting pot yeah. of different people. The game overnight goes professional, right? In 1995, a lot of my mates sat down with me and said, I'm not as good as you. I'm going to carry on being an architect. So we were the first generation of players who played six years of amateur rugby, Tuesday, Thursday night, to suddenly professional. And I remember my coach saying to me the next day, Nigel Melville, played for England scrum half. He said, um, how many days do you reckon we should bring everyone in? I go, what do you mean? You're asking me how many days? I said, well, I think Saturday's quite important, so let's get them in on Saturday and let's work backwards from there. So what I'm saying is there was no precedent for how you coach a rugby team right. professionally. So what you're assuming is that what these coaches are telling you is right. You were a leader. You were a, 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 a captain of your club. You were a captain of your country, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and and I remember speaking to Graham Sunas about leadership and what it was and what it uh, what it represented to him and what he thought it was because I think there's been a vast change over the period of time of what people think leadership is. Yeah. What do you what did you think leadership was? Because you were very young when you were put in positions of authority. And given what you're telling me about rugby, rugby comes, and some of it might have been because the sport was at a different stage in its yeah. development. But notwithstanding it, you were still picked out as the person that's the leader. Yeah. I think um, leadership to me is about persuading people to, and taking people to places they wouldn't ordinarily get to themselves. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, you need to be able to dial people up and dial people down and just, you know, have that chemistry. And successful teams, it's not about one individual. It's about the alchemy that exists between the coaching group, the playing group, and and it's about having honest conversations. You know, leading is about being honest, you know. It's, I think so. I think I'm comfortably honest conversations as well. But but when I say being that, fair. That's, that's not on social media. Yeah. That's not on, um, you know, in the papers. It's about no. behind face closed to doors, face to face. Would you like to explain what you're doing on Saturday? Because it doesn't appear like you're doing your job. Yeah. You know, and if you want to watch the game, you know, pay 30 quid like everyone else. You know, it's it's just simple, honest conversations with people. And, you know, you, if you if people want to call me out, that's fine. I, I'll accept that and I'll take it um, because it's for the best for the team. That's all you're trying to do in that environment is make yeah. us a better team. And as I said to you, we, people practice and practice on all sorts of things in any sport, you know, set piece, line outs, whatever it might be. The thing you can't measure and if you could, you'd be a very wealthy person, is what's going on in people's heads and what's going on in their heart. And I'm very big on this because my drivers, as we discussed for rugby, weren't about my love of the game. They are about the head and the heart. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, especially men, because they're quite vulnerable really and they don't like to talk about it, but when you're in a, in a changing room with a group of guys 10 minutes before kickoff, they're all international rugby players, they're all great players. Yep. I'm not gonna tell them how to play any better. I mean, most of them are far better than I am at playing rugby. But what you can do is find the right emotional touch points within each of them. And sometimes that it requires your own vulnerability to be laid out there open. Um, and you can connect the tissue between the head and the heart. And if you can do that, what you get is you get players who might deliver six out of 10 to give you nine or 10 out of 10. Yeah. And it's interesting, when, when you know deep down in your heart that the, the team in the change room next door are probably technically a lot better than you and, and just better players, yeah. you know. It comes down to something else. How are you going to beat them, yeah. you know? And rugby, perhaps more, more graphically than any other sport, is, you know, you, you can beat anyone because it is about getting the emotion right. Mm -hmm. It is about connecting the tissue and, um, you know, and, and getting grown men to really believe. And, uh, and that is, I think, you know, something quite special, really. I want to go back to you getting the England captaincy in 97. And obviously Clive Woodward gave it to you. Was it something that you desperately coveted? Yeah. And why do you think he gave it to you? It, it, I certainly didn't covet it. Um, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't captain when I... Uh, well, you were club captain by the time. Yeah, I you? was, but I wasn't captain of England when I, when I made my debut. Right. And, and I wasn't when I finished in my career. Okay. You know, so, um, you know, it's a... Well, not cover them, aspire no, 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 I think I, it's not, there's, there's no... Because you're a leader, right? Yeah, but the I more I talk to you, no, the more I, agree, the more I but, establish but, this conversation but, that you're a leader. I, I don't need to be captain to, to say something. Right. <laughs> you know, if you've got something to say, there's no point coming off the field going, oh, I think we should have done that. You know, but equally, there, there's a, there's a, 
there's there's characteristics in there that are, that are there from the start, from birth and from upbringing. But yeah. captaincy is also something that you can get better at and better at and better at. And I, I made some terrible mistakes as captain, uh, both at, at club level and at international level. Sometimes they cost you the game. But, so it, but that's part of leadership. Sometimes they it? didn't, but it's learning the art of captaincy. And I think if you are made a captain at an early age, you should theoretically get a, become a better and better and better captain. Over a period and, of time. And the 2003 team was full of players they were, also, were very good at rugby, um, were great men, but they were also players who were all captains of their respective clubs. Mm. So every time I played against Martin Johnson, he was captain of Leicester, I was captain of Wasps. Phil Vickery, Gloucester, you know, the list goes on and on. Johnny Wilkinson at Newcastle. So, you know, not all of them can be captain of England, but we had this incredible leadership group of about sort of eight or nine who had at some point all captain England, yeah. but week in, week out, they captain their clubs. And what that means is that they've led men into battle. You've got a team with ladies. They've, 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 they understand uh, they're students of the game. They understand people as human beings as well as rugby players. Um, and they've been in scenarios where they've practiced and they've rehearsed and they've been in those scenarios and they've come out the other side. So I think that the more leaders you can have in your team, going back to Eddie Jones's rant about not having any, um, is, you know, it strengthens you both, for sure. But again, I just want to... So, sorry, up... Clive, you're saying Clive picked me. probably because he, you, yeah. he's <clears throat> Clive is a really interesting um, man <clears throat> and... There's absolutely no doubt that we would not have won the World Cup without him. Right. Absolutely no doubt. I mean, he changed and revolutionised rugby beyond all belief. Um, <clears throat> there's been nine World Cups. Eight have been won by New Zealand, South Africa and Australia. And there's a reason for that. Which and, I'm going to ask And you. I think Clive became... Uh, Clive was a one of those rare people who played at the highest level. He played for Leicester, uh, England, British Lions. But he played in teams that weren't necessarily winning us in that era in the 80s you know right. they weren't great England teams they weren't great Lions teams and he then went and worked in in in, um, in business he worked for Xerox he worked in technology and then he came back to coaching and he became the England coach after a short stint at Bath whatever you know the first he, he did some incredible things which when you reflect back now the first thing, he's he's what I call a disruptor right right if England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland and France were obsessed with winning the five nations Okay, and he said, "Well, that's great, and and to be applauded." And Will Carling and Jeff Cook did an amazing job with England. But actually, if you want to win a World Cup, we've actually got to be obsessed with beating the best people in the world. Right, and which sounds pretty obvious, to yeah. Be honest. And yeah. and but if if you if you get into your little petty battles, uh, you know, against the Celts, um, then right. that, that's not going to work because you've got to be obsessed with New Zealand and South Africa, particularly that's how you win and World Australia. Cups. That's how you yeah. win. And what he did is he changed the mindset and said, "Look, we obviously want to win the Five Nations, Six Nations, but." What do you guys want to be? And he said, none of you are household names. He said, I want you all guys to be famous in a few years' time. He said, maybe not quite like you went about it, Lawrence, but we'll, you know, that's another subject. Um, and he changed our mindset completely. You know, the first thing he did when he arrived um, in the job was he said, New Zealand, the best team in the world, where do they stay when they come to the UK? He said, well, yeah. stay. Well, he said why is that relevant? And he said, well, they, said well, they stay in this place called the Penny Hill Park. He said, not anymore, they don't. Let's kick them out. So yeah. it's quite mischievous as well. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> kick them out. And now listen, we were it took us six years to, to get to the top of the world, but it was a little message just to say, mm -hmm. we're coming after you. And I think what England were were famous for was was producing great victories, but when they played against the best, they weren't able to deliver it. And Clive realized that we need to become pioneers. We need to become innovators in the game. Yeah. What we used to do was follow what everything what, what they did in New Zealand and South Africa, by which time, once you followed it, they were already two steps ahead. So he did reinvent the game, you know, and he <clears throat> went over to America and found, you know, that they would do they had a defense coach uh, mm. uh, and, all, and brought all these specialisms to the sport, which, and then the key, we started to follow what we were doing. You know, England were the first team to have, to, you know, tight fitting shirts, because he, he, he took risks as well. Yeah. I mean, Jason Robinson, did we win the World Cup because of Jason Robinson? Well, he persuaded his CFO that 1.5 million pounds to buy Jason Robinson was a really good idea. Now, it turned out to be, an outstanding idea because he was one of the most talented rugby players but ever. At the time it was but revolution. it was a huge risk. Yeah. Never played rugby union. So there's a number of things that you trace back. And he made me captain probably because he felt that <clears throat> I was someone who he could talk to a bit more. I never knew Clive. I knew he was a player. Went to meet him and we had a chat. And <clears throat> I think we made a lot of mistakes in those first few years. Game has only been professional for two years. He's the first professional coach. Our first four games he charged were New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. Mm. I mean, I think we lost, lost two, lost three, drew one. Uh, no, drew two, lost two, um, and that was the benchmark really. <clears throat> and the game was was fighting, uh, you know, clubs v country, etc. Still fighting now. Um, 
and Clive was trying to pick those battles and then he realised actually the best thing to do is just focus on what we're all trying to do and it's, um, it's it was an amazing journey really um, before I get before I cover Clive Woodward yeah. in 2003 uh, it would be remiss of me not to ask you about what the situation you got yourself into in 1999 yeah you're a captain of the country you're a captain of a domestic team and you put yourself in the way of something yeah that put you in a situation where you had to resign or have yeah, the captaincy yeah. taken away from you what was that about um it was, I, was, I mean listen i don't have many regrets um in life but um yeah the that get myself involved in that situation was was a, a definitely one of them um i uh, had a bad week if i'm honest with you <laughs> <laughs> sounds like <lucky>, it <laughs> mate I, I, we lost to, if you remember we lost to wales okay I, at wembley now i was dreaming of playing at wembley as i'm sure you did i'm sure everyone in this room did right i never thought it'd be rug- I, have. I, ne- I never thought it'd be rugby of course you have i never thought it'd be rugby but to captain England at Wembley yep. against the Welsh, and it was their home game, uh, and we were playing for the Grand Slam, and um, I made a couple of pretty poor captaincy decisions, uh, and ultimately cost us a game. And um, I walked off that field, and I mean, I accept full responsibility for that defeat. I made, I made some poor decisions, and we should have won the game. I've never been as broken as I was when I came off the field. I did that long Wembley walk. I was gobbed on by a Welsh supporter, you know, and it's moments like that that you realise why Eric Cantona did what he did. Um, I sort of wiped the spit out of my eye. I mean, how I retained my, you know, my self control and, and whatever. But anyway, got into the changing room and there were, you know, everyone was in tears. I've no, the, the whole place reeked of death. I thought, my God, this is. And do you know what? Even in that moment of, of probably the worst low I've ever felt in my life, I thought, if this, we're going to make sure that this never, ever, ever happens again. Then the following week, I think it was that the following week or that week, I was on the on the back page of the, of the front page of the News of the World. That's my point. I got myself involved in a situation where, you know, I was talking to journalists I didn't even know, you know, entrapment. We all know what it is. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's fake news. You make it up. You get someone to, 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 to talk about things, boast about things. I shouldn't have even been in that situation. I um, always, you know, it's the, it's the sportsman in you. The first thing you do when you recover is you look in the mirror and go, you know, uh, who's to blame here? Uh, and 100% I, I was to blame for that. And you know what really upset me is not what happened with the news of the world. It's actually that I upset people that I really cared about, like my yeah. mum, like my family. I put people in a situation that they should, they didn't. And that, that's what really upset me. But how, how, I mean, I've got to ask you, because you're, you're a smart cookie. Yeah. I mean, you might have only been, what, how old were you then? 28? 27. <clears throat> so you're not, you're not a kid. Yeah. Right. How have you got yourself in a conversation well, the, 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 with the agent, journalists talking the, the about drugs? The agent at the time put me in. I mean, you know, they they were very um, clever in the way that they you know formulated this this sort of endorsement deal, etc. The agent put me in the room with them, but the fact is that I was left there on my own, and that right. was the stupidity of it all. As I said, I <clears throat> I'm not blameless in it at all. I mean, I'm you know I, how how I, that happened, I I, I only know, but it, it happened. Uh, but they created the story really, and right. and ultimately to sell newspapers. And the fact that I'm here talking to you, however many years later, and the news of the world is no longer, um, I think tells you everything you need to know about the way that they go about their business. Oh, I know the way that yeah. there's red top and, and, look, yeah. and then you know the following week you got the man on Sunday, you know, uh, with front you know page headlines when every other paper runs stories about British troops in Kosovo, and again you know I shouldn't have put myself in that situation. But let's take you back to a pivotal moment, which is the 2003 World Cup, a historic moment. <laughs> Because it's the first time yeah. that uh, uh, you and know the Hemisphere team and won it. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, I mean you know that better than I do. But the whole setup around the 2003 World Cup, because I have mixed emotions about Clive Woodward, and I'm interested to see what your take on him is. And my maybe my emotions are driven by the fact he came bowling into football with opinions that were steeped in very little substance. Yeah, I mean, if foreign coaches came bowling into football, and you know we 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 sort of you know worship the ground they walk on i think you know he's a disruptor and football only ever gave jobs to people in football you know and you know some some and, some, and, some, and granted and i'm some, not some, I'm, some work well some i'm didn't not work one so for well. conventional wisdom yeah. i'm not one for the orthodoxy not yeah. being challenged yeah. that's no not no i understand i understand where you're coming you know, from you know but I, all i see clive do seemingly mm. and you might and you and you might well turn around and say that's because he's got justification for it is seeming to be re- remarkably critical of the of the of the establishment not really having very much good to say about what's happening yeah, in English rugby. Yeah, but yeah. go back to two thousand and three, you know, going into that World Cup and being part of that team, was there inherent belief 
that this was a World Cup that was yours to win? Yeah, so Clive Woodward, 97, 99, we, we all played in the World Cup. Well, quite a lot of us did. Um, we got beaten uh, by New Zealand in the pool game. So Clive was two years into his tenure. We were a lot less experienced. We got beaten in the quarterfinals by South Africa, five Yanni De Beer drop goals. Um, we were bombed out of it. And it was, you know, it, it was very, very depressing. Um, I guess in the aftermath of that, Clive was given a vote of confidence by the uh, by Fran Cotton and the RFU, yeah. and he was given the job. And that really, out of the ashes of that devastation, um, and Johnny Wilkinson was part of it, Mike Johnson, I mean, a lot of the people that ended up being in 2003. So we'd been through that experience. Now, I know you talk and sit here with lots of people involved in sport, and you know they say you have to you have to go through failure to get success. There's not all, too much. Yeah. Not, all, not too much failure. Yeah. I mean, no one likes to lose, right? So, but there's no doubt that that experience made us realise that we were nowhere near where we need to be to, to beat the best in the world. Yeah. Quite clearly. We lost to New Zealand in the pool game. I mean, that was Jonah Lomu. I mean, that was a slightly different yeah. scenario. And then there was South Africa. The journey for the 2003 really started from about 2000, where we had this recognition that if we want to beat the best sides in the world, we've just got to get fitter, faster, stronger. We've got to dedicate our whole lives to it. We... We won pretty much, in fact, from 2000 in June in Bloemfontein, we beat South Africa, we beat, we beat, we beat South Africa yeah. to 2003 in Sydney, 14 games on the spin, home and away against New Zealand, South Africa, Australia. I mean, that is, that is the record I'm more proud of than anything yeah. in the world. It, interspersed in that was a defeat to, was a defeat to Scotland in 2000, right. where Clive made a... You know, a but those are not stuff. the sides that you're going to beat. No, World but Cups, we still should have won those games, yeah. but we didn't. And, you know, everyone was doubting whatever. But... And if you, you know, when you read out whatever whatever trophies you, you win, I have one Grand Slam, I probably should have been about three or four, really, but that's by the by. Would you swap those for one World Cup? You know, I don't know. You'd rather have them all. But mm. we learned some very painful lessons. But by the time we arrived in, in, um, in Australia, we were in exactly the same position as Ireland find themselves in right now. We were the number one, ranked number one side in the world. Right. We'd beaten the Southern Hemisphere consecutively, yeah. home and away. We were Grand Slam champions. We, 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 we were Grand Slam champions. Them, yeah. And we'd already gone that summer of the World Cup down to Australia and New Zealand and beaten New Zealand and Australia in Australia. And there was a method in that because outside of a tournament, the two greatest things you can do in rugby in Everest is to beat New Zealand in New Zealand and to beat South Africa in South Africa. Yeah. That is the two hardest things to do. And I'd never been to New Zealand in an English shirt before um, and played a game. So because, you know, because of TV, or whatever, I don't know why it was, but New Zealand didn't come over and play England because there was an argument over money. Um, right. and, and they like scarcity, the All Blacks, and they, they market it very well. Um, so for us to have achieved that, I think, how can you go to Australia and New Zealand if you haven't actually won a test match there already? So Clive said, has anyone actually won a test match for England and Australia? And no one put their hand up. Um, we said, so we're going to go down there and we're going to do it before the World Cup. Um, so there was a belief. I think mm. when, we left that, when we left Melbourne, having just beaten the All Blacks in Wellington and Australia in, in, uh, in Melbourne, and, and coached by Eddie Jones, um, and the All Blacks game was horrific. It was like you know we got down to six men. It was like rain. There was no try. I mean it was it was a it was just a, a a real brawl. But we came out on top. And then we got to Australia, and they were saying we can't score tries. And then we beat them by three tries to one. And Eddie Jones, I think, wound his neck in and probably thought actually <laughs> actually these are these this side's quite good. Uh, and uh, then we went back, and I think then I think everyone realised that actually you know we've still got to go out to Australia and win, but we are we put ourselves in a great position. Uh, there was a belief. And I phoned my mum and dad and said, uh, are you guys going to come out to Australia? And they said, oh, yeah, we're going to talk to you about that. We you know, money's a bit tight. I said, look, I can't say this publicly, but I think we're going to win this tournament. You know, I really believe we are. I said, uh, you've got to be there because I said... The only and this reason... was at the beginning of the tournament? Yeah, this was, well, this was, this was about a month before. I said, you have right. to be there and you have to be there for nine weeks because I think we're going to be there for nine weeks. Yeah. And I said, I'll pay for it. I said, because you've given me everything I've ever had in my life. And I want you and to I be, want you to be this, there yeah. to celebrate that. And obviously, it all finished with a lovely fairy tale ending. But um, we actually didn't play our best rugby in that tournament. And do you know why? Because being the number one side in the world creates a different type of pressure. Of course. And, and everyone plays their best game against you. And but that's the nature of the beast. Yeah, yeah. no, it is. But it's not. It's not a position that England had necessarily had been historically very comfortable with because they'd never been the number one side in the world. So, it's it's unique territory, is what I'm saying. And you know, we knew that the South African team was probably the hardest game. That was the one that was in the pool stages. And actually, that South African team went on to win the next World Cup four years later. But they were tough. I mean, they had all the players that went on to be successful. And we didn't have it all our own way. We managed to get through that game. 
you know, we had we had issues. Richard Hill was injured. We had 16 men on the field. The Southern Hemisphere definitely did not want England to win anything. Oh, absolutely. And they're throwing everything in their in their powers. But and then we had the, the game against Wales where it was all going a little bit wrong. Um, and then we had a bit of an honesty session afterwards. We sorted it out. And um, the semi final and the final, I would say, were, were our happy place. That's when we were sort of the whole squad just relaxed. We go right now. This is where the World Cup starts for us. You know what I mean? And you know, whereas other England teams seem to sort of get a bit more twitchy as they get towards the, the, the closing the deal out, we actually calm descended once we did into it. Yeah. We, what kind of captain was um, Martin Johnson? Because it strikes me as that, that Clive lucked out there. Yeah. Because he had you as his captain. That situation that we've just discussed. Yeah. Martin Johnson goes in as captain. Yeah. And I remember instances against Ireland where you have this psyche of the England team, they, they go out and they line up in the wrong place, they refuse to move, and I think that's fucking great. Yeah. Right, that sort of... Well, I mean, no one told us what, what, the, what was going on before the game. And what people but you still to... decided yeah, but not what, to move. But what people have to realise, I, I mean, you talk to boxers, you are dealing, no, you're not dealing with a rational human being, right? You are having a conversation with someone who's about to go into battle and about to get hurt and about to hurt people. So therefore, you're not dealing with the, with the rational... So when, we're, when people talk to you five minutes before kickoff. I mean, what place do they think you're in, mm. you know? So, it, it's, you know, there is a bit of forgiveness there because, it, you know, it wasn't us just being stubborn. No one had told us. But, but I think it's great. I mean, it was, well, what was really Didn't great, it exhibit the psyche what, of a team? Yeah. Well, what was yeah. really great is that the, um, you know, the Jobsworth who came out to, you know, move us, he said to the referee desperately, Jonathan Kaplan, little South African, he said, Mr. Kaplan, please, would you mind asking the English team to move to the other side of the pitch? Because they're currently on Ireland's lucky side of the pitch. I mean, it's beautiful, isn't it? And the referee, who's not known for his sense of humour, said, listen, mate, there's no chance of these blokes listening to me when the game starts, let alone before <laughs> it starts, <laughs> which I thought was quite good. But look, it, the game was won in that instance, really. Yeah. They were going for the Grand Slam as well, don't yeah. forget. And um, I think it was 9-3 at half time, and we ended up winning quite comfortably. So, yeah, Martin Johnson was um, and is, well, was an amazing rugby player. Forget the captaincy for one, for one second. He was probably one of the best players in the world, in his position. And people forget that because they always, because you're captain, they always think about the captaincy. Yeah. Just first and foremost. And the other thing that he was very good at was being able to treat every game as the same in terms of it, you know. So for those people who get a little bit nervous and overexcited, he could bring them down. Yeah. For those people who weren't there, he could bring them up. Bring them up, yeah. Uh, I wasn't qu quite like that. I think that the emotion sometimes sometimes you need to be a little bit more emotional for certain games than you do for others. Or but, different strokes for different. But also, he was it. also very good at, at recognizing that you know the majority of time he's he's, he's got his head buried you know in, in the second row, yeah. and therefore there are people in certain positions in the team, the back row, um, at scrum half, fly half, who who have to make decisions. You know, um, and he yeah he was a very very good captain, no doubt about that. I think what he tried to do and what he did very successfully is try to simplify the game because it's so complicated and everyone gets, you know, bamboozled with stats and numbers and all this. And so it's just, you know, it, it's this and it's, it's that. this and this and that's it. And, and, and people like that. So we're, we're very lucky. And as you said, we had a number of other leaders in the group. Um, and I think that ultimately we when we went out for that Rugby World Cup final, um, it's, a, it's a tough day. I was thinking about it with the Lionesses the other day because unfortunately it ended up being um, uh, in disappointment, but I had a worry that they'd played the hosts already in the semi-final. Yeah, and they they almost did what England did in South Africa in um, in Japan, where they'd beaten New Zealand. Right, and that almost and took that so much Everest, out of them. Yeah. That was their Everest, and I think yeah. to try and build yourself up again. Whereas we went into the final, we weren't playing the All Blacks because we'd watched Australia beat them the day before. Um, and I got to say, I was quite pleased with that because we had the dream final. We had the hosts absolutely in their own backyard in the final. Now. We'd and they're play, always so magnanimous we, we, Australians, we, we, aren't they? Oh, all the way through the tournament. Yeah. Dad's army, you know, is yeah. that all you've got? Yeah. We've just beaten South Africa by 30, 25 points. Is that all you've got? Um, but we, and they actually advertised where we were staying, go and make as much noise as you can tonight before, you know, so that we wake up, you know. It was just incredible. It was laughable, really. David but we, of the world. We'd beaten Australia six, six times previously. So we knew we were a better side than them. They knew we were a better side than them. But you've still got to go out there and prove mm -hmm. it. And we had all day... And it was a roasting hot day in, in uh, you know, in Sydney and Manly Beach, and you just want to go outside and just chill out and get your head straight. But you know you've got fans, you know, outside or whatever. So you were it was like goldfish, you know. And we eventually got ourselves to Homebush Park, and yeah, I mean, look, we should have won that game by a lot more. There's, there's this amazing psyche. I mean, England are the only country in the world to have won a World Cup at football, rugby, and cricket. 
probably because there's not that many sides that play that sport, but every single one of them has gone to extra time. Um, so we, we obviously love a drama. Don't we? There's, right. there's some, I don't know, there's something about it, really. Um, and England probably should have won a lot more than they have done, not just in rugby, in, in lots of different things. You think? Yeah, definitely. But closing the deal out is not yeah. easy to do at all. And That's an interesting statistic. I'd never thought along those lines. I, I mean, 1966, of course. 2003 yeah. and 2019. In the, and in now, the actually, sorry, yeah. we won the 220, didn't we, as well? But, yeah. but, but you know, the and it's, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely... I mean, and, and actually, that played a bit of a part for us because, you know... Um, Ben Cohen's uncle George, George was, yeah. you know, he came into the came in to speak to us before the before in the week leading up to the final, you know, and it and it and it not that we needed to connect the two together, no, but but it, but it, but it did, and yeah. it didn't hurt at all. Um, but uh, yeah, we we did make life difficult for ourselves. I mean, we should have been outside by half time. Uh, the game should have been done and dusted. But give credit to Australia. Of the six times that we played them before, they'd never played that well, mm. and they actually played very well. Probably the best they played. Well, they they, they probably had to to some yeah, extent. They're playing exactly. in front of their home and, fans, aren't they? And then we had the the whole sort of um, you know game management issue with the referee. We had a right. But when old... you think about that statistic you just gave, so it interrupts you. You won overseas mm. when we won the cricket World Cup and the. Yeah. At the football world cup yeah. they were at home yeah interesting and and home advantage is a big factor i mean france are one of the favorites for the tournament there's yeah. been i think there's nine world cups three of those nine so far have been won by the home team so it is possible but pressure can sometimes work against you you know new zealand won it when dan carter got injured and they ended up phoning up their fourth choice fly off who was fishing down on the waikato and said mate you're in <laughs> and they just got over the line, but it was nip and tuck when they were so much better than the side. So it's it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. Much harder away from home. And actually what I hadn't really appreciated, I mean, when I walked out for that final with everyone else, I mean, there was white shirts everywhere. I mean, it was, it was like you were at home though, really, because fans believed in us. I just want to top this part of it off with just finishing the part with Clive. And I, it might well lead into why we've got the travails and malaise yeah. that we've got. But... When you look back on on Clive Woodward, and and you've spoken about him and the fact that he was a disruptor, mm. and I suspect an innovator, um, yeah, he was, yeah. and an overcomer because he's th he's thought his way through problems, but you win a World Cup, and very shortly Clive disappears off the scene, mm. lands in MySpace in football two years later. But what's your overall assessment of? Clive Woodward and his influence. So I'd say specifically over you and your career. Players very rarely criticise their coach publicly um, because they're the person that, 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 especially when they're still coaching. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because control their destiny. Yeah, although <clears throat> although coaches aren't afraid to come out and have a press conference and, uh, and, and and have a quite an interest. You know, I've had many many conversations with coaches that I've you know worked with who've just come out of press conference. Said, oh, you enjoy yourself in there, did you? I said we got to go and pick up the pieces now. Well done. You really, you really mess that one up. Not often, but occasionally. And Clive, Warren, Gatland, they've all, you know, we've all had those conversations. Gone, yeah, well done. Now you've made, you just made our assignment even harder now. Um, so, Clive's impact on English rugby was was immeasurable, immeasurable, game changing, game changing. Um, you know, because he, you talk about leadership, he he changed the vision. Um, Jeff Cook and Will Carling and, and that group had taken England to a level, but you know, we'd conquered half the world, but we were never going to conquer the rest of the world operating the way we operated. The first thing he did, came in, you know, gave everyone a laptop, which the front row obviously took quite a while to even open and be able to turn on, really. But <laughs> and, and he turned around and he said, the team with the best IT is the team that's going to win. And Because he came from an IT background. Right. And everyone's going, what are you on about, mate? Yeah. The team with the best scrum and the best fly-off win. You know, that, that. but actually, you know, he started to give everyone laptops and then we would be sent our, our, our club performances well, like literally on the final whistle, and then you you know you'd have to, and and then he phone you up a little bit later on and go Let's talk us through that. So and actually, when you look at five years later, when you looked up at the coaching boxes of any international team, there's a suite of laptops all up there. So he definitely was ahead of his time. You know, he he did things that were very very different and interesting. You know, Jason Robinson said to Nike, "I need you to design us a rubbish shirt that's going to win us the World Cup." And they went, "Well, we've just given you you know ninety eight million pounds or whatever." He said, "No, no, no." I said, look at these. And he went away and he said, I've got this guy, Jason Robinson. He runs quicker sideways than most people do forwards, but you know, people keep grabbing his shirt. So he literally... Is that what he said? Yeah, he li they literally designed us a shirt to win the World Cup. You know, he, he, his attention, you know, what does he call it? Critical non-essentials. There are 100 things, 1% better. Now, <clears throat> when you bring in a group of coaches 
ultimately Clive was in charge, um, but you still got to manage those coaches. Yep. You know because they've all got egos and they've all got they want to they want the training sessions. If the training session is an hour and a half, they they want an hour of it, and you can't you know can't give every coach an hour. So I think he created the environment. He wanted English rugby when when you uh, and I think Gareth Southgate has is sort of achieved this now is that when you play for your country, everything should be a step up. You know, you can't be at a club where things are better. You know, the Roy Keane argument was, you know, I'm at Man United, I go and train with Ireland, it's a joke. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that it needs to be aspirational and inspirational. And you need to create an environment that's so good, everyone wants to be part of it and no one wants to leave. And what he did in English rugby is create that. He right. created a situation where I'd finish a game at, at my club, I couldn't wait to get in the car and drive down to wherever we were and walk in that, that room and, and be part of that group. Um, unfortunately, in life, um, you know, there are moments when you get to the end of the World Cup. Um, and I knew when I was in that change room in Sydney that enjoy the, the, the best time I had, and, and I've spoken to all my colleagues about this, was that hour that we had together after John Howard had thrown the medals on us because they had to get off air quite quickly. And we're in there and we'd finally achieved our objective of winning the World Cup. And there was just this enormous sense of relief, as you'd expect, but just an excitement because, you know, there was all the management, all the players who hadn't played, but who'd really sacrificed a lot, and all of us, and we were all together, there was, t you know, there was every emotion, people in tears, there were people laughing, there was everything going on. But I knew that as soon as we walked out that door, that team would never be the same again. And Johnny Wilkinson didn't play rugby for England for another three and a half years after that night. Martin Johnson retired almost immediately. Most, some of the other players were so emotionally, mentally, and physically worn out because, uh, but we're right in the middle of the rugby season. The rugby season's just started mm. at the World Cup. So I had a phone call from Warren Gatland, and everyone's case is different. I'm not saying mine was right or wrong. And he said, you know, well done. Really proud of you. You know, couldn't be proud of you. Uh, you can have next week off. Um, and you'll be at Newcastle parading the trophy with Johnny Wilkinson. But, you know, you, you need to play in the, in the European Cup game the following week. I was going, great. Or Wasps, yeah. Yeah, great. I was delighted because I was still fit. And I was still, I'd lo I still had loads of batteries left. And I... <clears throat> went on to win the European Cup and the Premiership that year. So it was, I think it's called a raw flush in most, in most sports. Mm. I mean, it's just an fantastic, hey, yeah. every time you lace your boots, you want to you wanna win. Um, but then I got to the Six Nations and Clive gave me the captaincy of England back, which I don't know, you know, I, don't, I wasn't craving it in any way, but it was nice to, to round the circle yeah. a little bit and just, yeah. you know. The ultimate redemption, yeah, I suspect. And, but unfortunately, he gave it back to me. <laughs> but I looked around and that was... Half a team same, gone, yeah. you know, yeah. there's literally, and we lost to Ireland in the Six Nations, um, Brian and Driscoll's Ireland, and then we went down to New Zealand and Australia and we got humped by 50 points in three test matches. Now, I don't know who planned that itinerary, but it was just, you just can't, you know, we'd put so much, invested so much into winning the World Cup that someone with a bit of hindsight probably should have said, you know what these guys need is a summer off. All right, or they need a sabbatical because we can't keep going to the well and expecting them to do things. And look, Clive, you know, understandably um, had sacrificed his life as well to, to the cause. And, and he was starting to get some interesting phone calls. I was with him when Rupert Lowe phoned him up and we were at the Pennyhill Park and we were just before we were going on tour. And I went, oh, get a job in football. Right? It was a strange little conversation yeah. between Rupert <laughs> Lowe and yeah. Clive. I said, you get a conversation in football, are you? And he was obviously denying it. But I think his... You know, his head was definitely in a different place mm. and he decided to pursue that. But the RFU, uh, there, there is some accountability that needs to happen really at the RFU because I don't think, and look, I'm not blaming individual people, but not building on that legacy was poor. Well, that's my point. I, I don't think England have ever quite got that right, right? Because the, the, the subsequent appointments of England coaches would... would, would be testament to the fact that they, they, they didn't make the right appointments. Well, that would be my next point, because it would appear, before we get out into England of today, I mean, all roads lead to that particular point, because post a Rugby World Cup that we've won in 2003, you would think that would be the launch sequence <laughs> yeah. for continued success. But it isn't. Yeah. It's the polar... OK, we get to the 2007 yeah. final, yeah. so that's not bad for the defending champions. Yeah, but but was... other than that, we don't win... We don't win a Grand Slam for 12 years. Yeah, there's no right to do it. We don't even win the championship. But that, but we don't even win the, the championship. Is it normally you yeah. would expect when you've, when, yeah. you've, when, you've, when, you've, when you've given yourself an opportunity yeah. to build upon something, yeah. you'd build upon it. So that leads me into where we are now. I mean, we are going into this World Cup on the back of this period of time where there's been a lack of success, 
okay, Eddie got us to a final in 2019. Yeah. Um, and as you say, there's no God-given right to win anything, but you'd like to think that you'd start to win things it, yeah. more regularly. Yeah. Um, what's your, I mean, what, I mean, what's your assessment of the journey that we've been on since the World Cup, Eddie Jones's tenure, and where we are now? Um, because he's got the be he's got the best win record. Yeah, he's got the highest percentage I mean, of, of, of you, winning. I, I have to say, picking up from a few things that you've said, I'm not entirely sure that you're one of his biggest admirers. Have I read no, that no, wrong? no, no. I like him. I like him a lot. I like him as a bloke. Uh, he's you know he's loose, um, and that's not why I like him. But he's loose right. in terms yeah. of what he says. You yeah, know, he says things, and you yeah. think, oh, that's a bit, a bit. You know, he can't say that. He's done it in press yeah. conferences, isn't he? Um, and you know, he used to throw grenades. It was much more fun when him and Clive had press conferences. I'd say, what? I mean, no wonder the whole press would be there because you knew it'd be lively. <laughs> And uh, they'd just be throwing grenades at each other. Um, but I think he got the job because England were at their lowest end. Yeah. England had given the job to three coaches who have turned out to be amazing coaches. They're all in Ireland, or yep. one has now moved to France, Stuart Lancaster. The other, Andy Farrell and, and, uh, and Mike Catt, are now very successfully coaching Ireland because they've made, already made all their mistakes States with England. England yeah. Now, England have got this habit of, of employing people. Um, For the benefit of someone yeah, else. Well, though. just to say, guys, um, I know you haven't got much coaching experience, but have a go at coaching. Have a go at the best job in the world. Uh, and, um, you know, if it doesn't work out, don't worry, because we'll, we'll just find some. I mean, Martin Johnson, amazing rugby player, was offered the job to coach England, but never coached a team before. Now, I've got nothing but admiration for him as a human being, as a bloke, but if you've not coached before, you can't just put him in there and expect things to work. You need to surround him with people that mm. might help you. Now, the Kiwis got it right because they had, you know, Steve Hansen, Graham Henry, they sent them over to Wales to uh, to make their mistakes and coach. And then, you know, and then they came back to coach the All Blacks. And instead of just appointing one of them, they appointed all three. They got Steve Hansen. But is that just not, I mean, do you, th do you think that's constructive or constructed well, what I'm, or what just I'm, a quirk of fate? No, what I'm saying is that you, you, you know, to be a, a, a great coach, you know, it's, it's it, you're going to make mistakes along the way. And, yep. and you know, it's, it's for England to have given. I mean, there's a reason why. One, that everything that we built was dismantled. I think there was a not invented here syndrome. I don't know whether it was jealousy, Clive Woodward. Clive Woodward automatically probably should have just gone straight into the top job of director of rugby and been in charge of of maybe the structure that was required to um, you know to, to, to keep England going in, as a superpower in, in the game. Um, <clears throat> but that didn't happen, and I don't know why, whether it was jealousy, etc. And England went from being the number one side of the world to, to there. And every single appointment... Uh, it's felt has not necessarily been um, conducted in the right way. And what makes matters worse is that the appointment, there's, there's no ownership of the appointment. Uh, you know, we've got an independent uh, anonymous panel who are going to do the review of the England team and then they're going to appoint the next England coach. I mean, if you appoint someone, you, you need to, who, who made that appointment? Who's responsible for that? Did it go right or wrong? And there should be some things. Yeah. So <clears throat> Andy Robinson, Brian Ashton, Martin Johnson, Stuart Lancaster, I don't think... All great individuals, all great coaches, but should they have been given that job at the right time? I don't know. I just think that when Eddie Jones was appointed, you know, it was uh, it was obviously he was coaching in South Africa. Eddie has had an amazing record because he took England there. I mean, timing and everything in, in jobs is quite important as well. Yeah, when Warren Gatland arrived at Wasp, we were in a mess, you know, and he looked at it and thought, oh, if I can't have an impact there, then it's something, you know, he looked at the squad, looked at the players and thought, there's, there's a reason why these guys aren't playing well. So timing is everything. We won three titles in three years there. So I think when Eddie Jones took the job with England, you know, one, he got a pay rise, and two, he's, he's probably thinking, um, you know, there, there, there is much more, uh, the total is much more than the sum of their parts at the moment, you know, and yeah. his impact was instant, actually. And therefore, when you say you don't like him, I do like him, and he is a very good coach, you know, what he's achieved. But if you look at his his record around the world, there is success. It's, you know, but then there is there, this, uh, there's this... It's Mourinho-esque, there, there is problem. And I yeah. interviewed him right at the beginning of his England tenure when, when the first two years went really, really well. I was working for BT Sport, and I said to him, you know, and he's a, I know him quite well. He's yeah. a guy that said, look, you know, we beat you. You were one drop goal away from winning the World Cup, you know, and you didn't win it. I said... Um, you stayed with Australia for six years. I said um, you had instant success. You 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 restored their reputation by winning the Bledisloe Cup against New Zealand, something they hadn't done, and you took them all the way to a World Cup final. And apart from Johnny, you'd have won it. You stayed on for another two years, and it all went horribly wrong. You know what? What would you do differently? He said, "Oh, mate, mate, I stayed too long. Not, I won't make that same mistake again." So he, he did four years with England. The first three years were unbelievable, and then we get ourselves to a World Cup final. It goes horribly wrong. Um, in the World Cup final, 
and they do a review and they reappoint him. And the next two years, you could tell what was, you know, it's, a, it's almost like history is repeating yeah. itself. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think that. Uh, well, I guess he is what he is, isn't he? I mean, yeah, but if someone, if you, yeah. so, so he said, I'll never do that again. So, you know, losing the World Cup final, he, he could have stepped away and said, right, that's two I've lost now on, on you know, one with Australia, one with England. Um, but England offered him a new deal and, and you know, he, he, he took it. Uh, and I don't think, and this is where Clive and I will most definitely agree. I'm not sure that there was a proper review conducted after that, after that, after that World Cup, um, because if there was, then that that wouldn't have happened. And going back to my point around trust and consistency, <coughs> in his six year tenure, he had 23 assistant coaches, so 23 people that are giving messages to the players. Mm. That is why they are so confused at the moment because. Every time they just learn about something, the message changes again because coaches can't stay with him because you yeah, know, but hang on. There, there is a huge burnout but rate. Hang on, you. <coughs> you told me at the beginning of this conversation to, you know, that most of the time the players decide what's no, going no, on. No, 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 they don't. No, I was talking about our generation of players. We didn't decide. We we're very respectful of our coaches, but if we disagreed with what our coach was asking us to do, you put your hand up and say, Right. Said, it's not, it's not, you know, guys, we're all in this together. You know, if we win, your reputation will go up. And if we win as players, so will ours. But, uh, you know, we're not, you can't be at odds with what they're asking you to do. I think you should run and score a try against those three meatheads there in the line. Well, no, I don't want to do that. Why don't I run at the space over there? That looks like a far better idea. You know, it, just because they're the coach doesn't mean that they're right. And just because you're the player doesn't mean you're always right either. Mm. You know, we, you know, but you need to have the ability to challenge in both directions. Coaches challenge you as players to become better players and to improve. And you, as players, should be challenging the coach to be a better coach as well. Borthwick being brought in. Um, one of his strengths being to add clarity, apparently. Yeah. Um, well, they are confused. I mean, they are. Well, yeah. yeah. Blimey. <clears throat> but equally, Steve, like Eddie Jones's most successful two years of, England, of, of coaching England was when Steve Borthwick was the forwards coach. Right. So I can under, and then as soon as he walked away, it, it, it was quite the same. It wasn't quite the same. So Steve is <clears throat> a disciple of the game. He's a student of the game. He 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 is. <clears throat> he brings detail. Um, he <clears throat> was not expecting the job now. He was expecting the job after the World Cup. So he's been parachuted in. And I think what he what he left to go and f enhance his coaching credentials and his understanding of the game, the two years after Eddie Jones, I think what he came back to, I think he was quite surprised and shocked by what he came back to. Right. Because he came back to a squad that where the standards were had fallen, for whatever reason, they'd fallen below where they were when he left. Uh, whereas you don't expect that, do you, really? And he has come into a bit of a mess, really. And in that time, it's not just on the field, Three clubs have gone to the wall. You know, there's been a lot of problems going on in English rugby at the same time. He, again, is, um, you know, you've got to pick up the pieces in a year before the World Cup. I mean, it's, it's not really the, the plan in anyone's, uh, you know, view or book is to, is to appoint a coach for the World Cup and then sack him a year before the World Cup. I mean, South Africa managed to do it. And Razi Erasmus came in two years before. But I would argue that that was probably two years was enough, given the talent pool that they had to turn things around. And actually, they they created a game of rugby that was slightly, um, you know, playing to their strengths. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the easiest on the eye. I mean, they they won the final. I mean, they lost they lost the first game comfortably to the All Blacks, right? And everyone forgets that comfortably. Then they went away and they and they sort of rested and recuperated and let everyone else have a go at it. And then they were in prime condition. And they've but they are a, a, an incredible side. So Steve's come in. I think there's a lot to fix there, you know. And he's, he ain't going to be able to do it overnight. And he's got he's got a relative. Are you, I mean, are you? I mean, this is, is this knowledge that you've gained as a result of Steve Borthwick's experiences, or did you know that this was likely to be? No, the no, no, Steve no. This, this has been into. a steady. This has been since two thousand and three. Right. I mean, come on. I mean, England, yeah, England, England, England have got no defined. England have got no defined right to win anything, right? Um, and none of us ever believed that. But you know, consistency of performance is. There are certain levels that you 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 sit sit behind, you know. And, you think uh, this group of players that Borthwick's got? I mean, these results that leading into a World Cup are being in any other sport, he'd be in far more trouble, I suspect. But then again, I guess the challenges are that you got a World Cup coming up, so you're not going to take him out yeah. again, not take someone out again. But is it simply not just the case of the players aren't good enough? I think that the the the, the time to 
Yeah. When I watch them. I mean, how do, you, how do you, ideally, you want to win a World Cup, right? But then in the four years in between, you want to, you want to, you want to, there's still things you want to win in between. Yeah. Now, now I, think... I watched them in the Olympic Internationals <laughs> against South yeah. Africa, yeah. and I didn't see the malaise no. in the side that, that has manifested itself six months later. Well, they've won four games in 13, so. I, I accept yeah. that. And in the last three years, we've only won two out of five, five, six Nations games, two out of five. So we've we've lost more games than we've won in the last three years in the Six Nations. So, you know that's that's not the, that's not the England I know, and therefore so these are not problems that that Steve Borthwick has, has just stumbled across. No, I think there's been an, a, a, there's since systemic. Yokohama the review needed to be a proper root and branch thorough review, and the recommendations or or the or the thought or the ideas and the brains around what should be done after that should have been implemented. There are players that probably. You know, thanks very much. You've probably played your last game for England, mate, um, and you move on. And that happens anyway in a World Cup. And, and the secret of being a player is knowing when that happens before it happens, really, and being able to time your exit and leave by the door that you want to leave by. Um, and I think that we have just made a lot of mistakes. And, and, and I think that the you know that rebuilding into the World Cup is uh, has been has been very very difficult. I don't think the, the squad. You know, Saracens got relegated as well. Don't forget, which is, which I think people don't understand the implications because about a third of the group that make up the England team are from that club. So there was a natural sort of, um, you know, they they were playing rugby in the championship. You know, is there enough leaders in this group? Do you think? Yeah, there is. There is. There, well, there, it's a, there is enough players in that group who have got vast amounts of experience. Some of them are going to their fourth World Cup, but. From the outside, it appears that that, that leadership group was a bit fragmented. Matt think. Dawson doesn't think there is, does he? Well, I don't think we uh, we're not screaming out with world class players, all right? No, you know, this is not me being critical. If you asked anyone who who, who follows the game of rugby uh, international level to pick a world fifteen, I'm not sure there'd be too many English players in that team. Mm. Would it make a lot of difference to you if you saw or heard? Players owning their experiences because it seems to be a thing that resonates with you about owning, yeah, but owning I think, your performances. I, I think you have to. Would you that have, show a characteristic yeah, in the yeah, England team yeah. that gives you the feeling that there's a little bit more? Well, about I think them. I think the fans deserve it because you know fans pay a lot of money to follow their yeah, team, yeah. and I think fans deserve it. Do you know football has really come on in in many ways? Because I, I remember there was times when I used to watch Match of the Day or watch a, an interview with the football. And I used to think, God, I'm not sure I'm play. What are you saying? It doesn't make any sense at all. And actually, now what we what we've done with football players is, is they've they've actually not all of them, but quite a few of them. Like they're they're really happy and talk to the camera and they talk yeah. in a, in a vet. They've really really changed. Yeah, well, they've developed. Yeah. They've developed beyond all belief. Rugby players seem to have gone backwards. I mean, you know, you don't hear from them enough. Um, you just in order to. You know, everyone talks about drive to survive and all that stuff, you know, and it's like the model for, you know, growing a sport. Formula One are used to having people around them all the time. But the only way you can really fall in love with a sport, if you don't, if, you, if you've not been brought up with it, is to understand the human beings that exist yeah. behind the game. If they don't talk to you... And you can't. You can't, right? Yeah. So therefore, um, I just think there needs to be a much more emotional connection between the fans in rugby and, uh, and the players. And I think that they want to do it, but for whatever reason, they're... They're being held back. Or do you have a theory on that? Well, I don't know. Whoever's in charge of that is is not doing is not got the right strategy because unless people, because then it leaves a void where we're not quite sure what's going on. So we just so draw, we fill it with so else. we draw our own conclusions, yeah. or mm. we just go, oh, I'm a bit not really bothered bothered about that. You know, you got to take people on a journey emotionally with you. You know, England fans have been on a journey with us for six years. They they were there for all our highs. They were there for the lows. They stuck with us, and we got to the top of the world together because. You don't do it on your own. You do it together. Uh -huh. And the greatest feeling in the world. I've never been involved in a in an individual sport where you know you could get to the top of the world and it'd be quite a good feeling. Give yourself a pat on the back. But to do it with a group of people where you where you stumble along the way and you pick each other up and then you get to the top, that is a far greater feeling. To be able to hold hands and say we did it together. And I think that's what this this England group. My expectations are that they will win. They'll qualify for the quarterfinals, and they could potentially beat. Um, any of the teams, they'll, they'll play either Wales or Australia in the yep. quarterfinals, both of which um, Eddie Jones's comments and Warren Gatland's comments, you know, might might be good, might be bad. You never know. Uh, England will have their own motivation. So they could actually find themselves in a semi-final. It will be, um, it will be a, a very different World Cup because rugby, a bit like football, is changing all the time. There won't be any red cards because the referees will go, that's a yellow. And the, and the bunker referee will decide if it, the, the, the TMO or the VAR will decide if it's a red. 
why would you? If a referee's got a chart a safety net of, of giving a player a, a yellow, uh, then he will. Um, there will be a lot of things that are different about it. Um, New Zealand will play some amazing rugby. They'll probably play you know, the best rugby in the tournament, but they may not win it because I'm not sure they've got the, the forwards. That are... Who do you think will win it? Well, I want, I want England to win it, obviously, but I've, I've paired back my expectations. I think they'd be coming from, uh, you know, Frankie de Tori esque from, you know, from, from, right, from right, right back in the field. Right back in the field. I think Ireland have got everything that is required to win that. Uh, they're the number one side in the world. They've won in New Zealand. They, they've got the belief. They do need to keep Johnny Sexton and um, Gibson Park, their scrum half, fit uh, over all the games. So it's been interesting to see how he, how he does that. Would we have won without Johnny Wilkinson? Well, we never know, but we got to a final with him fit. And, you know, that was a huge, huge reward for us. If I had, to, I mean, I go back to, to to the data. Six of nine World Cups have been won by South Africa and New Zealand. So, um, you know, you, you have to respect both of those countries. So you're going to pick? Well, fr I think France or South Africa will, will win the World Cup. Um, and I, I can't choose between the two. I said South Africa last time. Well, uh, you must want the South Africans to win because you want to retain, retain the no, title no, of the no, only... That, uh, that's, where you, that's where we differ because I would like nothing better to, for, for, than England to have won two World Cups since, uh, since 2003 because... I want other players to experience the feelings that I felt. I was in, don't forget, my last game of rugby for England, international rugby, was in 2007. And I was in the World Cup final dressing room and we just lost the final. And, you know, the emotions were, as you'd expect, you know, traumatic. I, I've, you know, I'm, I'm traumatised, but I wasn't as traumatised because I already won a World Cup final. Yeah. So I want players to have that feeling. I'm not one of these guys that thinks, oh. No, I want English players to experience yeah. it. No, but, but we need to, we need to. Northern Hemisphere. We need to change the, um, you know, the, 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 the sport. And it would be great if, um, you know, until England won it, there was, it was only ever the Southern Hemisphere. So now we've got That's England on there. And the only Southern yeah. Hemisphere. Okay, so I would prefer, if it, if it's, if it, I would prefer either France or Ireland to be on there rather than New Zealand and South Africa because they've won it six Fair times. Point. They've had enough. We, Fair you know, point. You know, we don't, we don't need them winning anymore. So if it's not, if it's not going to be, it can't England. be England. If it can't be England, yeah. then any Northern Hemisphere side will do yeah. us. And those two are the two best sides in the world uh, by rankings, and they've played the best rugby over the last 12 months. So it's nice to see if they can take that onto the biggest stage of all, where there will be pressure. Pressure, if you're French, you see yourself on billboards all over the country. Mm. You know that, that? I mean, DuPont, they've got the best player in the world. It's amazing, but they've got to deal with that. And I hope they can. And if it's, you know, Ireland, I mean, the Irish have always had an amazing team, but they've never delivered at a World Cup. They've never got past the quarterfinal. And with, wouldn't it be ironic if Andy Farrell uh, and Mike Catt, uh, who were both delivered coaching England, <laughs> delivered the outcome? Uh, because uh, England we will see. didn't appoint them or didn't stick with them. Lawrence Delali, I've really enjoyed today. Thank you very much for being so upfront with me. Thank you very much. Upfront with me, Simon Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. Future episodes can be found on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly.